Hello, Craig and Vex and Sebastian. Hello there, Patrick over on YouTube. So today we are going to be uh, looking at the some teachings from Zen Master Linji. Looking at those together, one of the great Zen masters from uh, ancient China. And uh, before we start with that, we'll practice a little bit of meditation together. And before we start with that, we will give some time for people to join in here live. Okay, hello, uh, Skoza. Hello. And uh, Jewel, welcome. Morning, Nina. Good time wherever you are. Maybe it's not the morning for you. Hello there, Nino. Yep, so it's pretty much morning, Nina. Uh, what time is it there, Nino, in the heart of the Nordic lands? It is currently 4 p.m. Great. It's a good time. <laughs> Indeed. How are you this morning? Good. Yeah, quite good. Hello, Mantis and Robert and non-existent over on YouTube. Hello, Fluffhead. Okay. Hello, Drew Morris in the UK. On YouTube and uh Hello, Sonia. Going to start in, um, let's just take a few minutes to uh, practice a meditation and then we'll get started with our reading, our group study. So go ahead and find a uh, comfortable position for your body. Right on time, Houston and Techno. Just find a comfortable position for your body. I like to sit cross-legged 
um, but you don't need to sit cross-legged necessarily. Um, just a comfortable position that is also upright. So you're sitting in a way that is uh, not slunched over or tight or constrained in any way, but sitting with your shoulders back, your chest open, your stomach open, and as we find that comfortable position to be in, and start to really uh, listen to our breath and listen to our body. And a good way to do this is we can start to take a few deep breaths. I'm not exaggerated, not, not like intense deep breathing, but just to breathe in deep and bring the mind home to the body, feel the breath in the body at this moment and enjoy that um, experience of breathing. And breathe in a way that is non-judgmental, so it doesn't matter how you're breathing, it doesn't matter if your breathing is deep or shallow or tight or loose, and not important. Um, just that you're you're taking these deep breaths and giving your body exactly what you need. And bringing the mind home to the body. A lot of the time we are listening to our thoughts and stories and complicated ideas and judgments and we're thinking about our mistakes and you know what we could do better um, but here we we start the process of listening to the truth by listening to the body listening to the breath at this present moment Just breathing and being aware, listening to the body and the breath. If we approach breathing in the right way, then it's really something that is easy to enjoy, right? Because we enjoy getting what we, what we need. Um, and the breath at this moment is exactly what you need. So breathing in deeply, giving yourself exactly what you need, feel a sense of joy and also relief that you don't need to do anything else right now. You don't need to think of anything else right now. But just breathing, bringing the mind home to the body and listening to the breath and the body. listening from the heart, listening from the body itself, our awareness itself. We can also feel inspired and encouraged 
by everyone else who is here making the decision to uh, listen deeply and to show up deeply at this present moment. So that we are doing, practicing this deep listening not alone, but uh, as a part of a community. And surely we can feel that aliveness. And that support that we don't need to put on any kind of image right now. We don't need to present ourselves in any kind of way. But the only thing we need to do at this moment is listen to the breath, be aware of the breath as it flows in deeply and flows out. No judgment, just breathing and being aware. So following the breath as it flows in and flows out deeply, what do we notice? What are we aware of at this present moment? Is there any pain in the body? Is there a feeling of tightness? Is there a feeling of relaxation or even a sense of enjoyment? Whatever it is that we notice as we follow the breath coming in through the nose and flowing out just to listen, just to notice what's happening right now. We practice to develop this familiarity with listening, but also this connection to the present moment, that there is this present moment. There is this lived experience here and now. So 
So what is it? What is happening at this present moment? What are you aware of? What do you notice? As the breath flows in, flows out. Okay, so um, this is our regular 10 a.m. Uh, gathering, and um, we've been spending these uh, this 10 a.m. time slot to kind of come together as a group and look at uh, Zen teachings. So a particular form of Buddhism is called Zen. And it's very, uh, very focused on this present moment realization of enlightenment, oftentimes expressed as seeing your true mind, your original mind here in this present moment. So today we are going to um, continue looking at these teachings together. And we're going to be uh, specifically looking at some uh, Zen stories, kind of short stories of Zen activities between enlightened masters, between unenlightened people. And uh, I'll kind of look through that and discuss and see if we can gather any uh, wisdom, if we can gather any insight from that. Um, as we go through these Zen stories, <clears throat> please feel free to uh, stay in a meditative way of being so that you are listening from the heart, listening from the breath, listening from the body, rather than getting too uh, stuck in the intellectual mind. Before we begin today, does anyone have uh, any questions or anything they'd like to bring up or share? And if you're here in the Discord, you are invited to share your camera. If you can turn on your camera, then that's really good. You can be generous in that way. So let's begin with our um, Zen readings, our Zen stories. One day, and this is from a collection of Zen teachings from Master Linji. One day, the master went with Puha, so Master Linji. One day, the master went with Puha to eat a meal at the home of a lay believer. The master said, One hair swallows up the huge sea. One mustard seed holds Mount Sumeru. It's a great mountain. Is this a manifestation of super, supernatural power? 
Or is that just the way things have always been? Puaha kicked over his dinner tray. The master said, too coarse. Puaha said, where do you think you are, talking about what's coarse or what's fine? The following day, the master once again went with Puaha to eat a meal provided by a lay believer. He said, I wonder how today's hospitality will compare with yesterday's. Puaha, as before, kicked over his dinner tray. The master said, That's all right, to be sure, but it's too coarse. Puaha said, Blind man, in the Buddha Dharma, what talk is there of coarse or fine? The master stuck out his tongue in alarm. What the heck's going on here? What's this all about? So some context here. This is the two monks. One is a great well-known master and this other one is a puha, this kind of monk that represents something like crazy wisdom, crazy insight, crazy enlightenment, we can call it. So one day this uh, Master Lin Chi, this master monk, went with Puaha to eat a meal at the home of a lay believer. So there are monks and nuns, people who give their full lives to the Buddha Dharma, to be the monk, to follow uh, the Buddhist teachings, and live a life of renunciation. And then there are lay believers who support the monks. They believe in Buddhism, but they are still to be, have a husband or a wife or a partner and have a job and live on their own, these kinds of things. So that's a lay believer. So the lay believer invite Master Linji and with Puaha, together with Puaha, uh, to eat a meal at the home of this uh, Buddhist follower. During the meal, the master said, One hair swallows up the huge sea. One mustard seed holds Mount Sumeru. So this goes into the topic that um, within this present moment is contained all moments. Okay, within a flower, it contains the sun. If you look at the sun in the right way, in the proper way, you can see a flower in it. If you look at a flower in the proper way, you can see the sun in it. Okay, this goes to the case of interbeing. So one hair swallows up the huge sea, inseparable. One mustard seed holds Mount Sumeru. One tiny seed of mustard has within it the whole mountain, Mount Sumeru, this great mountain. It's actually uh, some kind of mountain in Buddhist cosmology that is uh, at the center of the world. So this huge sea, this huge uh, mountain in the center of the world, a single mustard seed holds it within. So is this truth, <clears throat> we can say the truth of interbeing in some sense, is this truth a manifestation of supernatural power or is it just the way that things have always been? Puaha's answer to this was to kick over the dinner tray to kick over the, uh, the food that was offered to him. The master said, too coarse, coarse versus 
fine. Coarse versus subtle. Okay. Too rough. Puaha said, where do you think you are talking about what's coarse or what's fine? The following day, the master once again went with Puaha to eat a meal provided by a lay believer. Uh, a well-known monk or a great teacher monk is going to be invited all over the place to eat. They'll want people to be never-ending to invite this master to, to feed him. So the following day, once again, the master went with Puha to eat a meal provided by a lay believer. <clears throat> he said, I wonder how today's hospitality will compare with yesterday's. Puha, as before, kicked over his dinner tray. The master said, that's all right, to be sure, but it's too coarse. Puha said, blind man. In the Buddha Dharma, in the great Buddha teaching, what talk is there of coarse or fine? The master stuck out his tongue in alarm. So what's this all about? What's this all about? Well, we can say <clears throat> that meditation is not a place for good or bad, right or wrong, isn't it? If you are sitting in your meditation and you say, oh, that feels good, let me get more of that, well, you're going to find yourself in the kitchen, in the refrigerator. Or God knows where, Buddha knows where, right? If you are to be sitting in meditation and then you feel, oh, that doesn't feel good, I don't like that, well, then you're never going to learn how to meditate. You're certainly never going to uh, develop an ability to be with suffering, to be with difficulty. So we can safely say that meditation is a place of going beyond good and evil, right and wrong. If a mustard seed holds Mount Sumeru, then can the truth hold kicking over a dinner tray that someone has offered to you? Flipping over a table in a restaurant? It can hold anything. It can contain anything. It contains everything. In the same way that a mustard seed holds Mount Sumeru, one hair swallows up the huge sea. You can cover up the sun with your thumb, can't you? Had you ever done it before? Right? <clears throat> so let's go to the the next story another story with uh, Puha. I like Puha a lot. I aspire to be enlightened enough to kick over dinner tables uh, with with great compassion. But you can't fake it, you know. Don't try to go and kick over a dinner table. <clears throat> 
So one day the master was sitting with Ho Yang and Mu Ta, two elderly monks, around the fire pit in the dirt floored part of the monks' hall. So you you bring you can bring this imagery to your mind of ancient China, an ancient monastery in ancient China, and um, this great enlightened Zen master is sitting with two elderly monks around a fire pit in the dirt floored part of the monks' hall. Someone took the opportunity to remark, Puaha, our 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 good friend Puaha. Puha goes around the streets of town every day behaving like an idiot or a madman. I can't tell whether he is a common mortal or a sage. So maybe they're in a similar position that we are. This person's acting crazy. What's this about? So someone took the opportunity to remark, Puha goes around the streets of town every day behaving like an idiot or a madman. I can't tell whether he is a common mortal or a sage. Before the speaker had finished, <clears throat> before the speaker had finished, Puha came in. The master said, Are you a common mortal or a sage? Puha said, You tell me, am I a common mortal or a sage? The master gave a shout. Puha pointed with his finger and said, Ho Yang is a new bride. Mu Ta is an old Chan granny, Zen granny. Lin Chi is a little brat, but he's got an eye. The master said, This thief! Puha said, Thief! Thief! and left the hall. So what's going on here? Nino, you want to share? You have some idea? Go ahead and unmute. <clears throat> I, um, I'm a little bit confused. But that's the beauty of it. And um, this is not the story I had in mind or how it was going to unfold. So I'm very curious to see what you have to say about this. Okay, so one day the master was sitting with Ho Yang and Mu Ta, two elderly monks. And these, the identity of these monks is not particularly known around the fire pit in the dirt-floored part of the monk's hall. Someone took the opportunity to remark, Puha goes around the streets of town every day behaving like an idiot or a madman. I can't tell whether he is a common mortal or a sage. Before the speaker had finished, Puha came in. It's quite convenient, right? The master said, Are you a common mortal or a sage? Puaha said, You tell me, am I a common mortal or a sage? So there we may be the back and forth of labels. Okay? What is a common person? What is a sage? You tell me, it's up to you. You think I'm a nice person. The next person thinks I'm not a I'm a bad person. What are, where are we going to get to the bottom of it? With swords? Right? That's how it's gone for a lot of human history. So it's appearances. It's a label. It's not real. You're a, a good person. You're a bad person. You're a common mortal. You're a sage. You get it. You don't get it. It's just nonsense. Especially when it comes to other people's pos positions and perceptions about it. 
If we rely on that, if we get stuck on that, we're going to be lost. So, Puha came in. They they discussing. Someone brings up, I don't understand. Is this a common mortal or is this person a sage? Are they expressing wisdom or are they expressing confusion? So, the master said, Puha comes in. The master said, are you a... <laughs> Are you a common mortal or a sage? And a Zen master, of course, always ready, always there in the present moment. So master will go from listening to this uh, this person remarking about Puha to looking at Puha and asking him just fluidly, completely. No stuck. No, Puha's here. No, just one-to-one. -one. The master said, are you a common mortal or a sage? Puha said, you tell me, am I a common mortal or a sage? And the master gave a shout. So this Master Lin Ji, if you are enlightened, if you really get it, or if you are really um, deeply, wonderfully, amazingly compassionate, then by definition, every action that you take is going to be a compassionate action, coming from this place of compassion. So it may not it doesn't need to be what you think compassion is going to be like or what uh you know what we imagine that compassion is like that doesn't matter if you're a completely compassionate person then your actions are going to be compassionate actions period it's like a trap so the same goes with enlightenment or or more so than enlightenment enlightenment and compassion go together okay but so Master Lin Ji and certain Zen masters throughout time were known to be uh, to have these kind of unique expressions, ways that they expressed their enlightenment. Um, and Master Lin Ji was known for giving a shout. Okay, now if you or I give a shout, it's not coming from a place of enlightenment, right? We're common people, so we're going around yelling at people. Well, you're going to be put in the in the psych ward and you're not going to be enlightened when you get over there right so don't just go around shouting but for someone like master linji these shouts were coming from uh, spontaneous enlightenment sincere enlightenment so master linji gave a shout and a powerful shout right an enlightened shout so then puha pointed with his finger and said ho yang is a new bride Mu Ta is an old Chan granny. Lin Chi is a little brat, but he's got an eye. So when when Puha came in, who knows? Puha maybe he's standing outside the room and heard them talk about him and comes in. So they were talking about uh, Puha. Is he a mortal? Is he a sage? Right? Kind of meandering about these ideas. Now Puha has come in and had this dialogue with uh, the master. And then Puha points his finger and said, Ho Yang is a new bride. Um, Mu Ta is an old Chan granny. Lin Chi is a little brat, but he's got an eye. So Ho Yang being, you know, at, at this time in ancient China, you know, brides would be young, you know, and, and maybe... Uh, exchanged for uh, for land or property or for arranged marriages or something like that so uh, a new bride someone who is uh, new to this experience um, an experience that is not necessarily comfortable um, or set up in a way that is for that person Mu Ta is an old Chan granny, so maybe has been involved in Zen for a long time. Um, Lin Chi is a little brat, but he's got an eye, so he has something he can see in some way. Then the master said, this thief, so maybe that he has kind of taken um, this position as the host rather than the guest. You are like this, you are like this, you are like that. 
when before he when he first came in he was the guest so he's taken the position of a host the master said this thief puha said thief thief and left the hall So there's one teaching in Zen about if you can be free from appearances or if you can find the truth wherever you are, then you will always be the host. You will always be at home wherever you are. There's no place that will be um, outside of your home, outside of your truth, outside of your own two feet. If you can be free from appearances, so you can act and react in a way that always puts you back on this position of your own two feet. Like a cat, you always land on your, your four feet in any position. But if you get stuck on appearances, then very often you're not going to be the host. You're not going to be at home, wherever you are. You're going to be lost in appearances, in, you know, you like this, you don't like that, and now you are controllable. Now you are easily led around by the nose, just like a guest in someone's house. So Zen is to find out that this is my house. When the Buddha became enlightened, he say, um, I alone am the world-honored one. Me and the earth, the Buddha touched the earth, me and the earth are awake. So finding this position of you being the world-honored one, who else is inside that brain? No one. There is no one else. There is nowhere else outside of this moment. So, coming home. Listening to the breath. Listening to the body. There's no one else here. You knock on the door. Who's going to answer? No one. <laughs> so let's keep going with uh, Puha. These stories of Puha. One day, Pu Puha was in front of the monk's hall eating raw vegetables. Okay, so Puha's in front of the monk's hall eating raw vegetables. The master saw him and said, Exactly like a donkey. Puha brayed like a donkey. The master said, This thief. Puha said, Thief, thief, and walked away. Puha regularly went around the streets of the town ringing a handbell. So something like what you see the Santa Claus. If you're American, you see the Santa Claus uh, ringing a bell. Donate to Salvation Army. Puha regularly went around the streets of the town ringing a handbell and saying, Come on the bright side and I will hit you on the bright side. Come on the dark side and I will hit you on the dark side. Come from four corners or eight directions, and I'll hit you like a whirlwind. Come from the empty sky, and I will hit you like so many flails. 
Because of this, the master instructed his attendant to go, and as soon as Puha had spoken in this way, to grab a hold of him and say, What will you do when I don't come in any of those ways? When the attendant had done so, Puha pushed him away and said, Tomorrow there is to be a meal at the Great Compassion Cloister. It's a small temple in the area. The attendant came back and reported this to the master. The master said, For some time now I've been suspicious of this fellow. I would like to say something. Go ahead. This uh, Zen master really knows how to cut through a, a space and bring everyone into a moment, regardless of the substance of what he's doing. But he always finds a way to practice Zen in its most pure essence, you know, bringing everyone to the here and now. That's all. I think that he's amused that uh, then she continues to call him a thief. That's what I get. What's at that? Is that? Your voice is a little bit low. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. No. I'll type it. You can speak it. Oh, okay. I said it, I, I think that uh, Puaha is a little bit amused that Lin Ji continues to call him a thief. I think there is a, a bit of amusement in his reaction to. Uh, every time he's been called that. Maybe you're the thief. I wonder what gets stolen here. What is there to be suspicious about? Suspicion and curiosity. Someone on TikTok says, what's with all this criminality?
Someone also say, shares, essential nature cannot be robbed. Essential nature cannot be stolen. So we'll finish with a um, a story of our our friend Puha. One day, Puha went around the streets of the town begging people to give him a one-piece robe. But though people offered him one, he refused all their offers. So. Puha went around begging for them to, to give him a robe, to give him a robe to wear. But though people offered him one, he refused all their offers. The master sent the director of temple business out to buy a coffin. When Puha re returned to the temple, the master said, I have prepared this one-piece robe for you. Puha shouldered the coffin and went off with it. He threaded his way through the streets of the town, calling out, Linji has prepared a one-piece robe for me. I'm going to the east gate to take leave of the world. The townspeople trooped after him, eager to see what would happen. Puaha said, I'm not going to do it today, but tomorrow I will go to the south gate and take leave of the world. He did this for three days, till no one believed him any more. Then on the fourth day, when no one was following or watching him, he went outside the city wall, lay down in the coffin, and asked a passerby to nail on the lid. In no time, word of this spread abroad, and the townspeople came scrambling. But when they opened the coffin, they found that all trace of his body had vanished. They could just catch the echo of his handbell sounding sharp and clear in the sky before it faded away. Okay, so let's find our uh, meditation position. Find a comfortable, stable position for your body. You can place your, your hands in your lap or on your knees. And close your eyes and take an interest in what's happening right now.
listening to the body. Listening to the breath. Not going anywhere. Not doing anything. What's happening right now?
Okay, we can all bring our hands together and we will uh, finish up our gathering with three sadhus. So you can chant along with me. This word sadhu is a traditional Buddhist word that means excellent, wonderful, good job. We can chant together as we finish our wonderful, excellent practice together. Sadhu 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 We can make a bow. Okay, thank you all for joining. We will have a meditation this evening at 8 p.m., so about nine hours from now. All right, be happy. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.